and welcome. I'm in conversation with Dr. Luba Konopasik, who is the Associate Dean of Medical Education and the Associate Professor of Pediatrics Education at Weill Cornell Medical College in Qatar. Dr. Konopasik is a nationally recognized medical educator. She has contributed to many renowned publications dedicated to training health professionals, and she is helping students to understand the human side of medicine. Dr. Konopasik, thank you for being here. It's lovely to be here. So I'd like to begin by asking you, what is humanism in medicine, and why is it so important? Well, humanism is really at the heart of medical professionalism. To be a true professional, a physician has to behave humanistically. Um, and as for definitions, that's hard. Um, when I do workshops with physicians on humanism, one of the first activities that we engage in is defining humanism. And physicians will come up with words like respect, compassion, integrity, caring, effective communication, empathy. They're all incredibly important words, but difficult to actually turn into an action. So um, one of the frameworks that I find very helpful was described in a paper by Miller and Schmidt, um, and it's about the habit of humanism as a reflexive clinical skill. And this framework is composed of three parts. Um, in the first step, the physician has to identify all of the perspectives in the encounter. The perspective of the patient, the perspective of their family members, perhaps of the nurse, perhaps um, an important friend, and also very importantly identify their own perspective very deliberately. The next step is to think about all those perspectives and think about how they might agree, how they might be congruent, and where potential conflicts exist. And finally, in designing a plan of care with the patient, they need to act altruistically and really think about what would be the best for the patient. So that framework, I think, is very helpful in teaching, and I, I use that routinely. The other um, part, often we don't think in the definition of humanism as uh, behaving not only humanistically to our patients, but also thinking about humanism as it relates to our staff, our colleagues, um, our whole team, perhaps our students, our professors, and also very importantly to ourselves. Self-care is something that we're increasingly ta uh, turning our attention to now in medicine. And honestly, I think it's very hard to behave humanistically if you are burned out as a physician. If you're burned out, it's hard to care effectively for others. So what are some things that doctors can do to become better at connecting with their patients and understanding their perspectives? Well, I think curiosity is a very important first step. Um, the physician really needs to care about the patient's perspective and be interested in what it might be. Um, the other piece I think that's important is humility um, and understanding that we might not know what we think we know, um, we need to challenge our assumptions and really take the time to ask the patient. A final piece that I think is important is really thinking about our opportunities for relationship building with patients and connecting with them. Um, it makes sense that a patient wouldn't necessarily want to share their perspective with you if they don't really trust you yet, if they don't really have a relationship um, with you. So how do we create those opportunities for connection, not just at moments of crisis, but really in every patient encounter? Um, one tip that I teach my students that's very practical is the unsolicited phone call. And what I mean by that is the phone call that the patient does not ask you to make, but the phone call the day after or two days after you've seen the patient when you're thinking of them. As physicians, we think about our patients all the time, but we rarely pick up the phone to call our patients and check in on them. And I was actually taught this through my own experience as a patient when a physician called me and I found it to be very powerful. Um, and so that's one tip that I give to my students. Now today, many health professionals try to practice objectivity, but can our observations of a patient ever be completely objective? Um, I think that's a, a great 
um, question to follow up on that patient perspective question. Um, because I think that physicians often feel that we are able to see things objectively. Um, but of course, just like every person, we view the world through our own lens. And that lens is informed by who we are, our history, our family, our culture, our medical culture, um, our experiences, both medical and just social. Um, and so I think in thinking about objectivity um, and how we can really better understand our patients and ourselves, um, we need to be very critical. One of the activities that I do with students and also faculty members is um, taking them to um, art museums um, to look at paintings and improve their observation skills. And actually the purpose of this activity is not only to enhance their observation skills, but really to have them think about uh, how they interpret what they see, what's objective and what isn't. Um, how does their lens play into this consideration? And um, I would say that I found that every group of physicians may look at a painting and see something different, the same painting. So that if I take a group of rheumatologists to see a painting, they might see the rheumatologic finding. And if I take a group of dermatologists, they might be absolutely certain that that very same painting, the person who is in that painting, has a skin lesion. Um, so already they're demonstrating that what they choose to look at differs, how they interpret it differs. And I think that as physicians, it's really important for us to, to be critical thinkers and to think about what's objective and what isn't. And again, bringing that patient's perspective in. Dr. Konopasik, you've witnessed firsthand the journey of so many students transitioning into doctors. In your opinion, what's the difference between a good doctor and a great doctor? Well, here I think I'm going to draw on um, William Osler who uh, many considered to be the father of med modern medicine. And he said, the good physician treats the disease. The great physician treats the patient who has the disease. So here, he's really talking about those humanistic qualities. Back to your first question. Um, so the great doctor has the humanistic qualities. They have excellence in medical practice, a commitment to furthering medical knowledge. And I would also add um, the great doctor also is committed to teaching others to be great. In the book Osler's Bedside Library, you highlighted Shakespeare's ability to turn common thoughts of life into gold. Why is this so important to you? Well, I think we often talk about the art and science of medicine. And a lot of the curriculum of medical education is about the science. We spend many, many hours learning the science. And in fact, throughout our careers as physicians, we engage in lifelong learning, most of it focused on the science related to medicine. And that's incredibly important. The art of medicine is much more difficult to teach explicitly. We do learn it, um, but really thinking about how we can learn it most effectively is important. Um, Osla recognized this as a challenge, and his recommendation was that every physician read for 30 minutes at the close of the day. And he suggested that that reading wasn't in medicine. Um, it was reading from the greats and the greats of literature, such as Shakespeare. I think there's a lot that we can learn from the humanities, and now many medical schools are actually developing humanities and medicine curricula uh, to complement all of the science that we're teaching. And the thinking is that through the study of humanities, our students can hone their critical thinking skills. They can become more reflective. Self-reflection is really important. And finally, they really can learn more about the people that they're treating and become great physicians. Now my final question is about inspiration. You have been an inspiration to so many students. Was there someone in your life who inspired you? Well, I've been extremely fortunate in that I've had wonderful mentors who have inspired, guided, and supported me. But um, here I think I'd like to mention um, two people who in particular inspired me 
as an educator and as a teacher of humanism. They were both pediatricians and educators. Um, so Steve Miller wrote the Habit of Humanism article that I uh, mentioned um, at the beginning of our conversation and also Rich Sarkin. And both of them were Gold Foundation traveling fellows. They traveled to medical schools to teach professors um, how to teach about humanism more effectively. This is a, a challenge for all of us. Um, and they were amazing. I learned a tremendous amount from them. They perished in a um, plane crash actually flying together to do a workshop on teaching humanism. Um, but they really inspired a whole generation of medical education and their passion for this subject continues to inspire me. Dr. Konopasik, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and we'll see you next time.